Hi, everyone. My name is Josh McClure from DQ. I'll be moderating today's session, Scoring the Accessibility of Websites, brought to you by Jared Smith and Christoph Rump. So I'm going to take care of a few housekeeping things before uh, handing it over to Jared and Christoph. Uh, firstly, this session is being recorded and it will be hosted on demand for registrants immediately after the session finishes. Furthermore, slides for today's sessions are available on the web page. Uh, if you require live captions for today's sessions, you may access those in the video player or in the stream text transcription link in the session page. Now, lastly, uh, we'll try to save the last 10 minutes or so for uh, Q&A in today's session. So please post your questions in the Q&A section located next to the video stream. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it on over to Christoph. So, uh, hi all. Um, my name is Christoph Rump, uh, but you can call me uh, Chris. Um, I'm a test engineering manager from the company Accenture. Um, I'm a yeah, male in my mid late thirties with very short blonde hair and uh, wearing a blue shirt. And I'm uh, yeah very happy to be here today uh, together with Jared from WebAIM. Um, he will introduce himself later uh, after I've shown the agenda. And um, yeah, as already said, we will now talk about the topic scoring the accessibility of websites. Um, but first, a few more things about, about myself. Um, I'm located in um, Switzerland and in Zurich, originally from, from Germany, uh, the city of Köln. Um, here in Zurich, it's already quite late. Uh, it's, it's around 9 p.m. Um, Next to accessibility testing and overall quality engineering, I'm uh, involved in um, agile delivery, agile coaching, and um, specialist, uh, specializing in uh, as delivery lead for projects in these areas. Um, just a few more private informations. Um, I love being in nature, in the mountains, uh, snowboarding, hiking. That's uh, one of the reasons why I came to, to Switzerland. Um, I also love art, painting with accrual, uh, recently started with sound installation, uh, trying out other things. Um, I'm also very interested in lucid dreaming and today I actually skipped one workshop for this presentation. Um, so yeah, um, but I'll be anyway able to see the recording afterwards. <laughs> so um, now let me give you a brief overview on the introduction. Um, Jared will start um, first, then in the second chapter, we will cover very briefly uh, the WCAG automation coverage. Uh, Jared will speak in chapter three about the difficulties of automated scorings. Um, then we will talk about the AIM scoring methodology in chapter four. And um, then in chapter five, we'll speak about findings and conclusions. And um, before then, uh, we go to, to the question part. And with that said, I will hand over to Jared now for the introduction. Okay, thank you, Christoph. Yeah, I'm also very excited to be here. I'm Jared Smith. I'm the Associate Director of WebAIM. WebAIM is the Web Accessibility in Mind project. Uh, we're based at the Institute for Disability Research Policy and Practice at Utah State University. And WebAIM functions as a nonprofit consultancy and uh, training group. We provide people help with accessibility. Our mission is to educate and empower organizations to build and maintain better accessible environments for those with disabilities. I'm a middle-aged uh, Caucasian man. I used to have hair before the pandemic, but less so uh, anymore. Um, Utah State University is located uh, in the mountains of, of northern Utah, where I live. And um, like Christoph, I, I love to spend time outdoors and with my family. So, uh, a little bit about as an introduction uh, to what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so Christoph and I met about, uh, first we're introduced about 18 months ago and have had just some really invigorating and uh, interesting discussions and collaboration over the last uh, year and a half on this. 
to developing and, and implementing this scoring methodology. It really was a collaborative uh, process between WebAIM at Utah State University and with Christoph and his team at Accenture. And our goal was really to better assess the accessibility of websites uh, using the web content accessibility guidelines. So as we started to have conversations, we, we had a lot of questions and things that we wanted to maybe better tackle. And um, these are a few of kind of the problem statements that, that, that we came up with. One was that it's that automated accessibility data we recognize is often insufficient to actually affect change with our clients, with Accenture's clients. We just, you know, you can get a lot of data, you can get numbers, but sometimes that doesn't actually best um, cause people to implement better accessibility. We also know that manual testing information and data can be more effective, but it's also very difficult, very expensive. It requires expertise and a lot of time uh, to, to do manual accessibility testing. We also realized that accessibility test data, whether it's automated or manual, is very often descriptive but not overly prescriptive. In other words, it can tell you what's what's wrong and what the problems are and maybe the depth of those, those issues on a website, but often doesn't provide very good guidance or prescription about how to start to address those accessibility issues and how to, how to prioritize and actually how to make the best impact on the experiences of those with disabilities um, that are accessing that web content. Um, we also, uh, another you know, question that we had was about the web content accessibility guidelines and conformance testing and how that doesn't always align to human impact. And we can have failures and we can count failures and, and um, issues with conformance and with automated testing, but we, it, it's sometimes difficult to know how that aligns with the actual end user impact of those with disabilities. So we asked the question of ourselves, you know, could we create a methodology that would provide automated data combined with manual testing and then provide some measure of human accessibility impact? Maybe put this together in a way that might be, might be useful for our respective clients and perhaps uh, to others. So that has really led to the creation of our AIM, our accessibility impact methodology. And uh, we'll talk a little bit later how um, part of that is um, scoring that's normalized to the web AIM million, which is an annual analysis of the homepages of the top 1 million websites. This is a methodology that we know is not perfect. It's still being refined, it's being evaluated, uh, but we found great value in it for our uh, constituents. And our intent in presenting this is not to promote our methodology as the only solution, uh, but just really to have a discussion around the challenges of accessibility scoring and to present some possible ways to um, possibly address some of those challenges. So with that introduction, I'll uh, throw it back to Chris to present a little bit more on uh, WCAG and automated data. Thanks, Jared. So um, yeah, let's speak very briefly about the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines and the uh, test automation coverage. Um, so um, standards and guidelines provide measures for documenting accessibility. I think that's uh, all common knowledge, what's what's written here on, on the slide. So we have certain legal financial risks, of course. We have corporate social responsibility and um, other country-specific guidelines. Um, then, yeah, we have the WCAG, um, the worldwide standard with the four core principles, perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. And um, yeah, what's important for us here for that slide, it's actually um, going more into the coverage, right? So for the guidelines, we have four principles, we have 13 guidelines, and in total, 78 criteria. Um, next slide, please. Um, speaking now about accessibility testing, um, this is the practice of measuring web and mobile app usability uh, for users with disabilities. And um, here we're typically looking at yeah, different, three different uh, categories uh, when speaking about um, tools for testing. 
So first we have automated tools. Um, then we have semi-automated tools, uh, meaning with, with human interaction. And then we have uh, manual testing. Um, starting with the manual testing um, here, as you know, we typically use screen reader, color contrast tools, keyboard navigation, and so on. Um, so we use tool accelerators um, to check manually um, if the criteria are fulfilled or, or not. For the semi-automated tools, uh, we have listed a few here. So we have the WAVE tool from WebAIM. Uh, here specifically the WAVE uh, extension, the browser plugin. Um, then we have the AIM methodology, which we'll cover later in our um, um, in our presentation. And um, yeah, then we have a lot of different um, open source tools, just as an example, NVDA, that's a screen reader, um, color contrast analyzer tools. Um, we have the Andy book, book, uh, bookmarklet. Uh, it's the accessible name in this uh, description inspector. Uh, which also supports doing several checks and also gives gives guidance to to the user to the tester. Um, we have a few more listed here: the HTML Visual Validator or the Web Disability Simulator, um, which lets you experience how people with different disabilities perceive a website. For example, uh, simulating color blindness or low vision. Um, then. For the third category, the automated tools, um, that means typically a pure page code analysis. Uh, we have just listed two, uh, the Wave API and also Google Lighthouse. Uh, but of course, there are many, many more out there. Um, looking at the test automation coverage, um, meaning how many of the WCAG criteria would you be able to test automatically, uh, semi-automated or um, manual? Um, you would typically say that around 30% can be tested completely automated, another 30% semi-automated, and for the remaining 40%, you would need uh, manual testing to, to cover these. Um, as you might know, this is more the conservative way of looking at the coverage. Um, there are new ways of automated accessibility testing, uh, which look differently at um, the, the coverage. Um, I'm pretty sure that you have, for example, seen the reports about the tool set from DQ, um, where an automated coverage of around 57% can be achieved. And um, I also heard about an, uh, from some colleagues of mine in Costa Rica um, who are promoting a, a similar, um, more automated framework, uh, which uh, covers a higher, higher automation coverage. And um, yeah, now I will hand over back to Jared for the next topic. Yeah, so I will be talking about the difficulties of automated storing. And um, you know, Christoph's slide kind of uh, kind of is a great introduction to that because there are so many different ways that, that we can measure accessibility. And even when we look at tool coverage, what does that percentage mean? You know, is it success criteria? Is it human impact? Is it is it individual failures and techniques within WCAG? Um, you know, is it number of issues throughout a site? There are a lot of questions here, and these are some of the things that we that we were, you know, Christoph and I and our teams together were asking about automated scoring and how these things might work. So, um, as I introduced before, we know that automated accessibility test data and the results do not always align with end user impact. Um, you know, there's a, a great example of this, uh, Manuel Matusovic, he created a website that was the most inaccessible site possible with a perfect lighthouse score. So he generated a website that had 100% 100 scores. Um, across performance, accessibility, best practices, and SEO. And it was like 
totally inaccessible and just totally awful when it came to the end user experience. And, you know, that's just, you know, it's not a hit job on Lighthouse or any other accessibility tool. It's just a reality of automated accessibility testing that they can't always tell end user impact. They're just looking for patterns of accessibility. But, you know, it does uh, kind of beg that question of what does, what does that score mean? What does a 100% score or an A grade mean when it comes to accessibility test results you know um, we know that a lack of detection of a failure does not mean that something is accessible right um, tools can detect failures they're pretty good at that at least detecting some failures but they aren't very good at detecting whether something actually passes or is um, accessible i mean something as basic as alternative text is a good use case they can detect instances of missing alternative text or obviously very poor alternative text, but very rarely can do a very good job of telling um, a tester whether that alternative text is equivalent to the content of an image. So anytime you know, we're presented with accessibility scoring, I think we, it's important to ask the question, what is the denominator, right? 100% of, of what? Um, and how is that determined? You know, is it automated test uh, result? Um, is it WCAG conformance? Is it somehow end user impact? And how you know, how do we how do we come up with this score? And ultimately, there are going to be some um, a, a level of uh, being arbitrary in that, or at least maybe favoring specific disability types. So this slide shows three different um, kind of measures or or uh, detected errors in the web content accessibility guidelines, guidelines with maybe a suggestion that they're all equal. And this is this is not what we're presenting, <laughs> not what I'm suggesting that these are equal, but it's uh, some of the uh, kind of the, the question that is posed when it comes to automated data. So for instance, um, you know, let's say you have one WCAG 2.1.1 failure, which is a keyboard accessibility failure. It's defined in WCAG as being a level A failure. Uh, that's going to be very impactful for uh, keyboard users. Um, and then maybe we compare that to a WCAG 3.1.1 failure, which is language of page, ensuring that the document language is, is identified. It's also a level A failure in WCAG. But, um, you know, what is the impact of that? Well, interestingly, the impact of language of page is most often nothing. It's, it's, it's almost no impact, except for when it is. When you do happen to have a multilingual screen reader, perhaps when their default language is different from the page, and if that page is not, the page language is not identified or is misidentified, then suddenly the impact becomes significant, meaning the entire page content might be rendered entirely inaccessible. And so how do you, how do you wait, say, a keyboard accessibility issue to um, a, a very rare, but potentially very significant issue of language of page. Are they are they equivalent, um, or is one more impactful than the other? And you might compare that to say, uh, which had four point one point one failure, which is parsing, which requires you know certain uh, valid HTML constructs. Also, a level A failure. You could, for instance, have a hundred. Um, parsing failures in a web page that have absolutely no impact on the end user experience. Um, and, you know, uh, some of them, you know, you certainly can have parsing issues that do impact the user, but many, or I would argue probably most of those parsing issues generally do not have an impact on the user, at least unless they are also uh, failures elsewhere in WCAG. And so is, you know, are those parsing errors, are they 1% as impactful as a language of page failure or a keyboard failure? Ultimately, as you start to assign weightings or scorings to these things, you have to make some of these decisions of what that impact might be for the user and how different failures are weighted in comparison with other, with other failures. And, and those weightings, I think, are okay. But I think we need, really need to think through the process of how they're being determined and if there are maybe biases uh, that, are, that are informing those weightings and, um, 
it's it's a it's a tricky question, and even the the web content accessibility guidelines themselves arguably place disproportionate emphasis on screen reader users versus say those with cognitive and learning disabilities, where there's not very much in the guidelines that uh, cover those those impacts. Yet we we know that they can be very significant for users with those disabilities. So there are, there are a lot of things that could go into the uh, consideration for accessibility scoring that are not even in the accessibility guidelines at all. So, you know, as we started to consider this and, and what this might mean, one thing we, we know is that the typical homepage has about 51 automatically detectable accessibility issues or WCAG failures, at least based on data that we have in our Web a million analysis of the top 1 million websites. And that gives us a pretty good benchmark, a pretty good uh, set of data across a very wide swath of the web. Uh, it gives us insight into you know, what is actually happening out, happening out there on the web when it comes to automatically uh, detectable accessibility issues. And so, you know, we can look at the number of issues and certainly a detectable issue is usually going to have a negative impact on users. And that should, and at least for our methodology, is a big part of that scoring consideration. We might also consider error density. So error density is essentially the number of errors by page weight or lines of code or page elements or some other measure of the size or volume or amount of content within a web page. And uh, that's also, I think, really valuable. Um, the, um, the, the premise is that users may tolerate more errors if there's more content. Or maybe to put it another way, if you have a page that has, say, 10 elements and it has two accessibility errors, that's different than a page that maybe has a thousand elements and two accessibility errors. Right? The, the, you know, the user may tolerate uh, those two errors on, say, Facebook as opposed to a very basic information page. One of the difficulties with error density, however, is that if you want to improve an error density accessibility score, it's usually easier to make your page bigger than it is to fix the accessibility errors. And we have seen that in our Web a million analysis. We have seen over the last four years of this analysis of a million homepages, an eight, about an 8% increase in page elements every year. So the web is getting significantly bigger. Pages are getting much more complex, but we've only seen about a 1% decrease in detected errors on average per year. So in other words, if you just looked at error density, it would look like the web is getting much, much better. In reality, it's only maybe getting a little bit better, but it's getting much, much bigger. Um, so that's the error density problem, but we did consider error density in our methodology. Another consideration is content value or, um, you know, uh, you know, how would users uh, value the page? Are they more tolerant of uh, maybe accessibility issues on pages that are more, of more value uh, to them? That becomes very difficult to measure. How do you know how an end user might uh, appreciate the content on a page and thus perhaps be willing to uh, muddle through additional accessibility issues. And, and it's an interesting question about maybe, maybe scoring. Now, we know that manual testing solves most of these difficult difficulties and, and questions. It can provide great insight into these things, but we also know it's very time consuming and expensive. So these were a few of the things that we considered in our formulation of this methodology. Carl Groves has a great article on this. It's titled, So You Want an Accessibility Story. I just would refer you to that. He explores these and many other dilemmas and questions about accessibility scoring and so we we set out to maybe address at least some of these questions and dilemmas. Okay, back to Christoph. All right, um, we are now chapter four. Uh, so we'll now start speaking about the AIM scoring methodology. And for the scoring methodology, um, yeah, that's basically the methodology we had uh, derived um, out of our research. And uh, this consists of four elements. So we have the site crawling, uh, the preparation. Then we have the automated accessibility score. Then we have the manual impact score. 
and then in the end we have an uh, aim score um, for the data crawling and um, yeah, basically for for the preparation of the analysis uh, you typically would would define the scope um, so of course like the website you want to want to test and um, you need to identify what we had chosen were four sample pages uh, for for the later manual testing stage and um, yeah we figured through our analysis that four pages is a, is a very very good sample size um, because it provides significance uh, while minimizing uh, time um, for the automated analysis um, we are using the wave api um, so we then have the number of page errors of of, of that website uh, we have the error density and also we have the alerts uh, which are likely to to be errors um, yeah, through, through the analysis, we kind of looked at these three values and um, yeah, we're thinking how to how we were able to uh, weight these uh, to each other. So, um, um, yeah, first the idea was looking more at the user impact uh, of these. And um, yeah, basically, I think Jared came up like with an approach to think about 60% uh, average of the page error count, then 30% of the um, average page error density, and taking into consideration also 10% of the page alert counts. And um, yeah, in the future, we definitely want to fine tune that a little bit more. So that's just like a very first model we came up with. And um, of course, uh, when we're doing like more tests and more uh, practical pilots in the future, um, we think that we can also approximate um, these values um, <clears throat> for this automated testing um, to the uh, actual manual testing where we're performing. Um, then, of course, um, because of, yeah, typically we have a lot of uh, defects per page. Yeah? So um, one page could be have like zero defects, uh, but could also have 1,000 or like many thousand detectable errors. Um, <clears throat> we also had to came up with... Um, um, normalization, right? So we took the web aim uh, million there and uh, aligned um, the scoring there in deciles, and uh, then came up like with an automated score from uh, from one to ten out of this um, alignment uh, in deciles. Then uh, the manual impact score. I think that's the yeah, most most interesting part in the end. Um, here, um, trained testers are guided uh, through a manual testing process. And um, yeah, as Jared already said, um, manual testing solves a lot of difficulties, right? But it's very, very time consuming and expensive. So our goal was really to focus on a very yeah, time efficient uh, check. And um, yeah, we kind of came up uh, with the goal to have the overall manual testing process for one tester for only uh, to take only one hour and um, yeah that managed uh, that made it possible for us to um, adding the end user impact on the various accessibility issues uh, which had been detected in the uh, automated um, process so um, here in the end um, yeah, the tester also comes up then uh, with, with a score from uh, 1 to 10 again. And um, then out of the automated score and the manual score, um, we will then have the aim score. Um, at the moment, we're taking them 50-50, um, so we're just like building, building an average out of uh, both scores. And um, next to the aim score, we are also... Um, producing a report um, which so, uh, shows a little bit more more details 
um, as an example, um, the, the tester is also um, able to put in some comments about the test results, about the testing he's done. And uh, that provides a little bit more, more information for the person who then uh, reads the, uh, the score and the report. Um, to make it a little bit better understandable, uh, Gerald will now briefly show us an example of the AIM score on the report. Sure. So this is um, just our, our current representation of this. This is something that we're providing as a service. Again, it's, it, we're not here to promote this particular service, but to talk about how these things might come together and provide use and value. So our AIM scoring, um, again, is, is really comprised of the automated accessibility score, the manual uh, impact score from human expert testing uh, to generate the final accessibility impact or AIM score. So this is a, a sample uh, report or results. Uh, we did this uh, on uh, the NASA website. So we did the automated testing um, and we tested uh, just over 15,000 pages on nasa.gov, found 230,000 total accessibility errors for an average of 15.3 errors per page. As we uh, compare both the, uh, well, the errors, the error density and the potential or likely errors and align those with the web a million, we'd get a score of 7.1 out of 10. In other words, um, out of you know, web pages, generally, when we compare nasa.gov, we have a score of about 7.1. So better than average, but we know that average is pretty bad. <laughs> average is 51 errors on average. So we do have to consider that, you know, that even though this maybe looks like an okay score, there still are 15 errors detected um, per page. There's a brief overview of what those top accessibility errors are. Um, oops, accidentally clicked the link there. Okay. Um, next comes the manual accessibility impact score. Again, this is uh, by manual testing. Christoph will show you the items that we're testing in just a moment. We do that on a sample of four pages. Uh, our research has shown that a sample of four pages of a site provides a pretty good representation of the accessibility of the site. It's not perfect. We had to balance uh, you know, time and, and effort with uh, providing something that might be useful. So uh, expert testers go through and provide the scoring. It's based on uh, testing 10 aspects of accessibility through a guided process, as well as providing a bit of a holistic score from that tester um, regarding the accessibility of that page. There are also notes um, about uh, from our testers about the aspects of accessibility. So the person that gets this report can read uh, the end user feedback about that. And finally, uh, um, we have our ultimate AIM score, which is an average of the previous two, gives a sense of maybe the accessibility of that page in comparison to other pages and based on that manual testing. And then there's details about the actual detected accessibility issues through that process to help you know, prescribe and guide users as to what is happening on their site and the things that they might start to address to improve that accessibility. So that's just a quick, quick overview of uh, the methodology that we have. I'll uh, go back to Christoph now to talk about um, our actual manual testing process. Yes, so let me quickly go through the 10 questions we have. Um, so we created this manual testing questionnaire uh, where we identified the most impactful and readily uh, testable criteria. Um, and yeah, of course, we fully recognize that these are not comprehensive, but we figured that these have uh, a very, very high end user impact. And um, yeah, let me briefly um, read through them. So question one is about the um, documents defined language. Um, two is about uh, missing alternative text or poor alternative text. Three is about empty links and buttons. Um, four, about the impact of labeled or unlabeled form inputs. Five, impact of low contrast. Six, accuracy and brevity of page title seven movement and animations, eight presence and visibility of keyboard focus, nine impact of keyboard accessibility barriers and 10 support for page reflow and responsiveness. And additionally, the tester also records an overall page accessibility impact score. So uh, this is score is a little bit more subjective, um, but that is the, the intent to provide a human measure of end user impact. 
And uh, yeah, we kind of figured that the average of the 10 questions, uh, the score is very similar actually to, to the overall page accessibility uh, impact score. Um, at the moment, um, we're not differentiating between the weighting of this question uh, of these different questions. Um, but yeah, that would be one point we are uh, would be happily discussing at the end of the session, maybe. And, and clearly, there are things that are missing from this list. Um, these were some things that we found that could be readily tested in a fairly minimal amount of time. Now, when we look at the automated um, testing data, there's pretty good coverage across the web content accessibility guidelines. When we just looked at the guideline level, and 11 of the 13 guidelines have at least some components of data from automated testing that can provide insight. Um, you know, these could probably be expanded. This is not like full coverage of every success criteria or every possible failure, but we have some coverage, um, fairly broad coverage when it comes to automatic testing. When we add in the manual testing, what we really wanted to focus on was deeper coverage and primarily focus on the end user impact. And so this chart just shows that we got kind of deeper impact into 10 of those 11 covered um, guidelines. Um, so what that means, for instance, is you know, automated data would give you information about alternative text. Our manual testing process looked at quality of alternative text and end user impact of both good and bad alternative text. So it just shows that you know the, that our intent was to get was to get deeper and, and and provide value and focus with a with a measure of end user impact. Um, we, we didn't get we didn't get broader coverage when it comes to the guidelines, but we got deeper coverage looking at additional things and hopefully a useful measure of end user impact from that manual scoring and when put together with uh, the automated test data gave us our AIM score, um, which we hope is useful. Now, chapter five, uh, findings and conclusions. So uh, we have applied the AIM methodology in first practical pilots, uh, where we were able to perform a fine tuning of the, of the scoring. Um, the very first thing was the accessibility index report. Um, we started with that in late 2020, and um, back then the goal was to provide an accessibility ranking of um, yeah 100 large European websites. Um, but yeah, we had to decrease our sample size drastically to to down to 30, and um, that forced us to to rethink um, the ranking, also the approach, right, to define an accessibility score, and. Um, yeah, that's basically where we then came up with, with the questionnaire. And as previously said, uh, we try to make it as, as efficient as uh, possible to minimize, of course, the, the manual efforts. Um, so we did that with uh, testers from WebAIM and Accenture. Um, we found that testers rated the sites better on average than the automatic score. Uh, we had a very high uh, intra-class correlation coefficient which added great credibility to the, to the process, the manual testing process. And we also had high levels of inter-rater reliability. Um, then for Johns Hopkins University, um, that was done by WebAIM collaborations and collaboration with uh, the university. And uh, they created different uh, dashboards, one for vaccine websites, um, yeah, where they figured out that there are actually notable barriers, which was a huge uh, concern, and also had a yeah the research had a massive impact in the end on uh, on the awareness of, of accessibility. Um, then another one about uh, university uh, disability inclusion with an analysis of the top fifty NIH funded universities, where they also found a disparity across universities. And uh, here also the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, short SNAP. Um, yeah, where they also could show that there are significant accessibility barriers. Um, and this program is typically used by families with disabilities. So again, uh, a major concern. 
then now back to Jared. So we've been implementing this, we're collecting data and we want to refine this over time and we'll continue to implement and ask questions. And I'd, I'd love to hear your questions about this, um, about this methodology or you know, poke holes in it. We'd, I'd be happy to hear that and see if together as a community, we can maybe refine this. A few things that we found, we do feel that it is, uh, you know, the scoring is providing something useful, though admittedly incomplete. We know this isn't, we're not intending to measure all aspects of accessibility, but to provide some measure with minimal costs uh, and effort. Um, you know, our implementations we feel have been successful. Uh, they have been informative. And they really have helped to promote improvements to accessibility in those entities to which we have provided these data. Um, but we need we need more more tests, a larger sample size, uh, more feedback on this methodology. So some of the primary questions that we have are, you know, can this methodology be expanded to provide weightings for error types or by what CAD criteria or maybe by something else? We we know that's probably possible. And every time we go there, it just, it poses some of those questions uh, that I presented before and some of those dilemmas of, of favoring or bias and some real difficulties there, but we're hopeful maybe with more data that we might be able to further explore that. Um, we also consider future versions of WCAG with WCAG 3.0, the accessibility scoring approaches are, you know, shifting from like pass fail to more of a more of a scoring approach and how that might inform our methodology or vice versa um, is, a, is a real interesting question as we shift, again, the guidelines more to a measure of end user impact. Um, you know, the question of can these data and the, te the manual test data be used to help inform broader accessibility issues? In other words, can automated data and a very minimal set of manual test uh, results help you know uh, other problems that might be present on a website? Um, you know, can you, can you align those data to help better address the accessibility issues that maybe were not directly tested, but are likely present because of the things that were tested? And ultimately, our hope and our question is how these things might better affect accessibility change to improve the experiences of those with disabilities on the web. And with that, we will say thank you. And thank you to DQ for, for hosting and having this. And we'll um, you know, see if there are any questions. Jared and Christoph, thank you so much for this wonderful session. Um, there are many questions. I, I do want to say that was great content. Um, so everybody who has contributed and asked questions, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to um, pick through, and, and I do apologize if we can't get everything here, but uh, we will start off with uh, one of the trending topics, it seems. Uh, does Web Aim have any plans to implement uh, color contrast testing for um, for shadows and uh, and other um, you know we'll, we'll say CSS or, or textual based okay. content like that? Yeah, I'm presuming the question is in regards to uh, to Wave, and yeah, that's an interesting interesting right. challenge from a from an automated testing uh, perspective. Yeah, we'd love to tackle some of those things. We, um, yes. Now, I will probably stay in the context of this of this uh, methodology. While Wave can detect uh, you know, many contrast issues in in uh, text, one of those manual testing components was the impact of contrast failures that maybe extend beyond those that can automatically be, be tested. For instance, with drop shadows and con complex filters and background images and things like that. So that, I think, highlights uh, some of the power of this methodology, uh, combining the automated data with the manual test data. So we could help fill in some of those gaps where the testing tools uh, maybe can't fully test and allow a human tester to detect those things, uh, uh, non-text contrast issues, for instance, those in, in the images could be identified by, the, by that human uh, tester and then provided a rating or score that helps inform that overall score, plus um, documentation about what those are to help guide remediation of those issues, which you, you know, probably can't get from fully automated test data alone. Mm. Yep. Excellent. Uh, one of the other questions here, Wilco asks, 
how do you prevent drift of the score over time as automation improves? Oh, that's a that's a real good question. Maybe I'll see if Christoph, Christoph has an answer to this too. I think one is the alignment of that data to uh, the web a million provides a, a bit of a moving benchmark we are updating that analysis every year but yeah as you know hopefully hopefully there will be shifts right as our as our testing gets better as we refine the manual methodology hopefully we're getting a a, a better score that does pose a problem though maybe comparisons of stores across time when your benchmark is changing. Ultimately, I'm not too concerned about that. I'm more interested in giving uh, giving people something that they can take right now, know what the issues are and start to start to make their sites better. Christoph, did you have anything you wanted to add on that one? Uh, not, not really, I, I, I totally agree. Um, I think, I mean, our methodology is also subject to, to change, right? Uh, we're trying to improve. I try to improve the, uh, the, the uh, like, do the fine tuning also on the different weightings, uh, which is one, uh, still one of the open questions we have. So I'm also not, not really concerned. I'm rather looking forward to, yeah, tweak and fine tune further and uh, yeah, get this in line. Yeah. That's great. Uh, Amanda asks, uh, you indicated manual tests about four pages per site. Uh, is there a reason like percentage of pages or page types? I think the question ultimately is, um, why four pages? Mm -hmm. It's a very fair question. Um, it really was a balance of getting some depth plus a balance of time. We wanted to scope it to about an hour of time. That certainly could be ex expanded if we felt additional manual effort was justified and, and, and available for that test. Uh, in our research, we have found that when we do very broad automated accessibility scans and then test a sample of about four pages, that there is, is pretty good alignment between those, those results. So we do know that four is a, a pretty good proxy, not perfect, but an okay proxy um, for that. Uh, and we are not just choosing four random pages. Typically our approach is the home page, two significant content pages, and then one randomly selected page out of that broad sample that's automatically tested. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you, the, you want the representative sample of that site and which can be very challenging right the uh i'm sure with applications that are very dynamic and require a lot of user input and, and interaction might have different uh uh you know pages or form factors in that application so Yes. And, and, you know, while we do want something that's representative, we are choosing uh, pages that are likely most impactful, you know, the home page and major content pages, primarily to provide, provide some guidance on, on fixing the pages that are most likely to be accessed by users. Absolutely. No. Yep. Yeah. And one thing to keep in mind, right, accessibility is always a work in progress. It's not something you do once. It's not something you test and then you're done, right? So um, consider uh, starting off with a, a uh, specific journey that is going to impact the end users the most, right? And then build from there. So. And that is one reason for the methodology in that it could uh, be replicated and redone readily to, to, to track that, the, you know, progress over time. It's not intended to just be a, a one-time thing. If that's all that it is, that's great, but uh, that it could be redone over time to give you a sense of how things are improving over time. Yep, absolutely. Okay, we have one question left here, uh, or time for one question left here. Um, one of the, the themes that I'm seeing here in some of these questions, uh, is this testing methodology something that is open and available? For use. Christoph, you want to take that one? Yeah, I mean, we're uh, right about to, to figure that out, uh, how we want to uh, evolve here in, in the future. So there are some some parts yet, uh, which we have to, to automate first. Um, one, some part about the data crawling, for example, um, the um, overall 
uh, user interface also we're planning to do some some changes and um, yeah the idea is um, first certainly to get some more more practical experience to fine-tune that uh, that scoring um, yeah because in the end it can be sometimes challenging like bringing out a score to uh, the world wide web and like enabling companies to say okay they have a score from i don't know seven out of ten um, because some one of them made a test and they try to make it look official um, so i would say we're not yet there but of course the plan is to to bring it out uh, to to the public uh, right jared yep yep correct yeah we, we want some feedback and wanted to have this discussion but that's the idea is to make this or similar methodologies more available yeah Absolutely. Well, it, it does seem that uh, that is something that the community is is very interested in. Um, so, audience, definitely keep an eye out for that. I'm I'm sure uh, uh, Jared and Christoph will be uh, uh, providing some stuff out there in the wild. So. With that, we are out of time. I really, really appreciate uh, Jared and Christoph joining and presenting. And we really appreciate all of you out there taking the time to watch uh, and, and give your feedback and input. Uh, this is a wonderful community. We're so thrilled to have you here. Um, virtual round of applause for Jared and Christoph. Thank you very much. <laughs>